Now comes part two of the China Talk, the conversation with two good friends and businessmen who made their ways in China and moved back decades later. I hope you enjoyed the first one. This one covers how they met and how they started working together, their first venture, their second venture, what they learned from each, the snowboard factory, the perspective of people coming out of the cultural revolution in China, the echoes of the Mao era and cultural revolution and how that affected later generations, my attempt at starting a side hustle from my China experience and the people I met there, a story and a collection of stories about extortion and not getting extorted, and finally, hospital stays in China. Some of these statements and stories and bits are, might come across as generalizations about Chinese people. They're not intended to. In fact, I can't say enough positive things about how I was treated when I lived in China about by the students that I taught, the local population, and the friends I made who I still keep in touch with there. It's not intended to endorse the CCP. It's just intended to explain some of the things that happened and perhaps some of the cultural contributing causes that every one of us would probably adapt to in the same way if placed in the same circumstance. So without further ado, here's part two of the conversation about my friends making their ways in China. Y'all hadn't, got, hadn't quite gotten into the progression of your lives and careers after y'all met. You know, I think the last question was actually, when did we start working together? And it was, um, you know, after uh, I was running the supply chain at that, that LCD company and then David was uh, running the factory and he had a supply chain issue. I remember wanted to know if my guys could help. And that's kind of how we started collaborating. And, you know, the, next, the, the thing that we did after that, which is pretty interesting because we're both very entrepreneurial. I had been like selling hats kind of randomly on the side, like logo hats and uh, I don't even know how I got into it, but you know, so, as, as with everything in China, somebody sent me an email, probably said, hey, can you give me hats? I, I always just said yes to everything. I was like, oh, man, I can do this, you know? Yeah. So I, you know, David and I started a company called China Custom Hats. We got, I think it, it, you know, it may still exist on the web, actually. But I don't maybe. think so. I stopped paying that a while ago. Um, but China Custom Hats. And we, uh, Dave nope. said, hey, let's make a website. Mm-hmm. He, he thought we were going to be hat barons, you know? We are going to, like have a hat factory and had yeah. all these great ideas and we, we did pretty good, you know i mean you know back in the day dave i don't know we had some years we made yeah, 10 20 grand each you know it was a good good little run you know then that was that was pretty awesome but the, the, i think where we learned we weren't gonna be hat barons was when i had the idea of being a pga pro right i was like hey you know i got this access to this database like all the pga pro you know pga members in america have twenty thousand. We hired somebody, Dave, didn't we? To like email everybody? N- no, I think that you and I did that. Maybe we did. Maybe we did hire somebody. I don't no, we, remember. Yeah, we... we started doing it. And then you were like, hey, we should just pay um, one of these guys. I can't remember what it was. And we, and we had the template. And they just started emailing. I think we emailed like 6,000 people. <laughs> and you know how many orders we got? How many? Zero. <laughs> how many responses did you get? We got a bunch. We got yeah. a bunch of responses because, you know, we offered free samples in their logo. So people were like, well, yeah, I work at, you know, uh, Potawatomi, you know, public golf course. I'll take a free sample. Yeah. I mean, it was, so we'd make free samples and we'd send them over there. And then they were like, yeah, I love it. Thanks for the free sample. <laughs> See that was it. Yeah. yeah. We did. We did. We probably did sample. Oh, did we lose Dave? Yeah, we did. But we can keep going. And yeah. it'll pick back up by the time you're done. Um, sample wise, we uh, we probably sent 50, 50 samples. Uh-huh. We got zero orders, <laughs> and it was, shock- it, it was shocking to me that we got zero orders. Like I really, even to this day, I don't understand why we got zero orders. I mean, we were offering a cheaper price. It, the hats were great. They were made in uh, you know down the street from where we both lived. Yeah. Um, they would make us samples anytime we wanted. Yeah, but we got no orders. Anyway, that, but anyway, that was kind of the first. That was the first time David and I worked together. You know, you know what? You know what? That kind of taught me, actually. I've, I've had times in my life where I really wanted to sell to customer X. 
I just, that customer, I wanted that sale. I don't know why, you know, maybe I, for some reason, just got a little bit uh, just enamored with selling to this whatever customer. And so I became the chaser. And there's something weird about like, let's just say I, I need to get my car fixed. If a mechanic calls me during the middle of my day offering his services, my reaction is like, no, no, I, I just, you're bothering me. I didn't ask for this. Um, you know, you might be a good mechanic, but I, I'd like to. And so we just had, it, it, it taught me kind of like somehow uh, when you're fishing, right? It's almost like you want them to find you. It's like, and so we, we ended up changing our, our, our strategy instead of like us reaching out to everybody. Cause we know all those golf clubs and colleges or whatever they were, they all bought hats. They all had hats. Everybody, for some reason, it seems like it's human nature almost that if you're going to uh, bug somebody when they're during their lunch break or when they're just doing whatever they're doing, ask and ask them if it, you might get lucky, I guess. And maybe some people are better at this than others, but it seemed like the return was just not really great. And so we ended up changing and I started getting into using Google, you know, AdWords and all this, um, you know, I, I guess the online channels to, to generate traffic and, and to our website. And then we started getting, you know, organic leads or people from, you know, from, from search engines. And then all of a sudden they were reaching out to us and I was helping them. So I'd call Jeff or I would call them up and we'd offer them a solution. And then when we sent them samples, we could, we could get them to pay for it or pay for the shipping. It just totally changed the dynamic. You know, um, we were really eager. And so Jeff and I, we like, you know, chased any opportunity that presented itself, good, bad, or indifferent. And through doing that, we kind of realized what opportunities we didn't want. And also, you know, maybe we kind of refined some of our, sa our sales uh, strategies. It was fun. Uh, we, we actually did it for a long time. We did it for probably 10, 12 years, you know, just, just because it was like we had these couple customers every year, they just sent us an order. It took us a very little time. You know, all that started to change when, like, our factory, you know, got too expensive to make hats and, and send gins. And now, but now the hat factory's in, like, wherever. And then the hat factory ended up in Vietnam. And it was just like, you know, we're not going to do this anymore. Um, so we stopped that. But, you know, the next thing we did was the snowboard company. Um, and that really was, it was another learning experience. We still have it. It's very successful. But, but um, you know, David met a guy in, uh, at the bar. You know, you know, once again, where do you meet people in China, right? The foreigner, right? Um, he wasn't a degenerate, so which is rare in a bar setting, but they met him in a bar and a guy was making uh, snowboards and he was working for a guy. It was kind of a partnership with a, with a Hong Kong guy in a really crappy factory. Um, you know, the guy was from California, didn't speak Chinese, you know, was really struggling with the relationship of, of doing low volume. You know, he's a snowboard guru. He could design them. He knew the customers. But he's really getting screwed over, which is not uncommon in a lot of these relationships where we're in the West. We tend to build our relationships off of trust. Like, I trust you. I know you. There's a there's almost this immediate trusting, you know, like in America, I like to tell people uh, I have a friend. So even if I've met the guy one time, if I introduced him to you, Jason, I probably would say, oh, I got this friend. He's over here doing this. Well, he's probably not a friend. Right. I mean, how many friends do you really have? But that's the way we tend to talk about people in America. We're in China. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't hear anybody almost say, hey, oh, this is my friend, you know. Um, so what happens is I think as, as Westerners, we show up in China and, and we're friendly. Hey, you're my friend. So if you say, hey, we're going to do this deal together. We're going to, I don't know, I'm going to sell you something. Here's the price. Or we're going to have a business together. There's, very, there's a very trusting relationship, especially if you don't speak Chinese. So anyway, this guy... Um, he didn't speak Chinese, was very trusting. He was really getting screwed over. So, so Dave uh, said, hey, you know, we should, we could start a snowboard factory. And we don't know anything about snowboards, Dave and I. Um, we know a lot more than we did 10 years ago, but we didn't know anything. And, but we were so eager to expand off of our hat success, right? We we're like, all right, now we're going to build a factory. Because, you know, Dave ran factories. I mean, he knows how to run a factory. I, I knew how to do a lot of management stuff on the factory side and, and kind of uh, make finance and some other things. So... So um, it took a few years to convince our friend Dan to, to do this, but finally he did. And uh, we started a snowboard factory in 2012. Actually, it was right about this time, 2012, so 10 years ago. And, you know, the idea, once again, was, oh, this would be easy. You know, Dan knows how to make snowboards. 
Uh, you know, we'll we'll raise some money. You know, Dave can run the factory. Like this was going to be so easy. Yeah. And uh, we we it was easy to put together. So we put together a deal. We raised some capital. We put some of our own money in. Uh, we brought in a couple friends. Well, one specific friend who a Chinese national who was working for me, um, and he came to run the factory and set it all up. And we set up this factory and we and we got it put together in like three months. I mean, we 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 you know got a couple of customers to commit that they would join us uh, in this activity and. So we found a factory in Sinjin. We bought a bunch of equipment and started making snowboards probably around June of 2020, uh, 2012. So it was really the next thing that, that Dave and I did. And, um, and that's still going strong. And, you know, now we make uh, snowboards, surfboards, um, stand up paddle boards. We now make foils for hydrofoiling, which goes under surfboards and, uh, and things like that, which is a huge, a huge thing. We have a couple of brands that we've developed. So, I mean, nothing's easy. You know, I, I just gave you the, the three minute explanation of how easy it is. It's actually not it's been, it's been a struggle. Uh, but, you know, it's uh, anything worth doing is going to take some time and patience. And so that was that was the next thing we did. We realized a couple of things um, as we were looking for a new factory. Uh, we I, I'd known a guy named uh, Bosch, uh, a New Zealand guy making surfboards in another factory. You know, he had his own company. He was struggling a little bit with some things. We needed to expand our factory, grow bigger. Uh, over time, we developed a mutual trust and, and respect and said, hey, let's merge our company. So we basically bought his company. Mm. Uh, he run, and so now we moved our factory to another location. And just this month, we bought a, uh, a foil company, a similar thing you know, where we, we recognize the brand and the, the opportunity to make the product in-house, sell it as a brand. Mm -hmm. And that's the, it's the top brand in the, in the business. And um, we just did that this month. So we just merged, and uh, so now we have all those. You know, we call it we call it the surf and the snow division. So we have the surf and snow division, water, and we got all, we got all the seasons covered. Yeah, floating through the air. Yep. Either way, yeah. snow or on water. At, at our generation, you know, so I'm speaking at my wife's age, if she's the age, same age as me, mm -hmm. um, and she'll she'll say the same thing. Uh, is this is the generation that grew up, you know, with with nothing, um, came out of poverty yeah and and so their perspective is very different and there's a lot of mistrust at that age or the start of this generation because there was that was instilled by their parents to them there was a lot of mistrust because they would have the parents would have been active in in the 50s and 60s in china when you didn't trust anybody it was very very i mean you just didn't you didn't uh, you didn't tell your secrets you didn't tell people your business people didn't you didn't want to hear it you didn't want to know anything about it you just wanted to like turn a blind eye because there was a lot of upheaval in the country in the 60s, especially. So my wife grew up in an environment that, that was taught of her and expected of her, and that's what everybody did. That's kind of sad, right? Because I think in, in the West, we uh, maybe we're too, too trusting, right? So we become friends very quickly. Right? We're friends. They were buddies we just met, right? We're, great, we're, be we're best buds. Um, as you get older, right? As we get older, we know that that's not true either. You know, if your life, in your life, you only have room for three or four people. The difference in China, maybe on the business side, is that even if you meet someone and you know that, ah, you know, whatever, there's no transaction there, you tend to file it away, right? Because there could be in the future. <laughs> so I do notice that, that there are people who like pull, like pull people out from years ago. I mean, they never did a transaction. They never did anything. But all of a sudden, oh, there's an opportunity. Let me call that guy. Let me call that guy. Let me figure out how I can be in the middle and make some money here or do something or, you know, make a favor for this guy because he helped me before doing that. So yeah, it's transactional. But once again, I think in today's generation, I think it's a little bit different. I think it, it's, it's a little bit got more Western. You know, you know, like I remember my grandparents that went through the great depression, uh, even though by the end of their life, they, they were worth a good amount of money. Um, they would still fold, you know, and reuse, wash and reuse aluminum foil. Right they would, they had these really, really conservative practices with money because they'd gone through hardship that, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't relate to, you know, it's like uh, growing, you just didn't have that experience. And so China, if you look at it, like I, I talked about last time, how they became a driving culture over like a 30 year period where America, it's been 130 years or something like that. And so you just saw this chaos that very quickly kind of got forced into more order and more regulation and rules etc 
and you just saw an accelerated development there. You, you also see like China came out of a revolution and then becoming communist and then, you know, Mao era struggle sessions and turning in, you know, capitalist neighbors and just the, the poverty and the famine and the lack of trust of your neighbor because of some of, some of the political stuff that drove that. And so you just had a, a populace that had been through a, a different set of circumstances. And so for Jeff and I coming from, like, I would be surprised that my grandparents, you know, that had all the money they needed saving, washing, reusing aluminum foil. Um, I would see Chinese people that seemed to have no reason to behave the way that they were, but it was, they were all conditioned by the forces that or I guess the, the political stuff that shaped their, their upbringing. And so now China, you know, they've been more prosperous. You've got, like Jeff mentioned, you've got people that didn't have, you know, their neighbors turning them in or famine or somebody being sent to a work camp because they had the wrong ideas or whatever. And so probably less transactional and maybe more open. Um, and just, ha- just a different, a different type of behavior. So some of that I think was just maybe us, you know, I wouldn't say underestimating. We just didn't have that, that background. And so you, you learn after a period of time that just because someone says he's your best friend and treats you, you know, unbelievably uh, kindly, um, you probably shouldn't expect for that to continue the second you can't help them anymore, you know. Well, it's incredible to think about the echoes of the Mao era and how how difficult things got over there in the decades after that. And it still echoes into the people that some of the people y'all dealt with that are your age, your generation. I'm not calling you a generation too far older than mine but I would say I'm at the very end of the millennials. And I actually, you know, I, I still hear, I had some of the experiences that you're talking about in the short time I was there and the time I tried to go back and tried to try to create some small semblance of business with China. But I still hear from my, some of my students who are, who are younger, like you're saying, it's different among generations. But that's that phenomenon of that kind of, dictatorship that kind of oppressive dictatorship echoing for generations like that sowing mistrust in future generations that's a that's a really daunting thing to think about it still exists i think for people that come from you know the the inland parts of china Uh um but I mean, you, you look, Jason, you had some of that. I remember you came back from China and you were like trying to sell some stuff online and, yeah. and you were telling me and I, and I just, I let you roll with it. I was like busy. I wasn't going to like <laughs> burst your bubble, but you were like, yeah, I got the student. She wants me to sell these things online. Right? There were two students. This is really interesting. Actually, there are two students who worked with, I think company, I think all they did was have Amazon stores. That's it. They didn't make, I don't think they made their stuff. They just, took it and sold it on Amazon. And what they would have to do is deliver or send Amazon products to Amazon warehouses before they sold them, certain numbers, before they sold them to the American market or a Western market. And then when Amazon would at some point say, look, we stored your stuff for this amount of time, you have to pay us extra now if we're going to keep selling your uh, crappy smart watches or um, deer antler candle holders. These are actually two things that, that they were selling on Amazon. Can't hold it anymore. So you got to pay these storage fees. So then they would send me their surplus and I'd be like, okay, well, maybe I'll, I'll give a lot of these away and then I'll try to sell them. And one of those people I hear from a decent amount and the other one I don't hear from at all, ever. And I think I've tried to connect with that second person. Transactional. There you go. So. <laughs> But 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 there's another point too. Transactional isn't always just money. I remember there was a big like flurry of activity when I first got there. People wanting to learn English from me, yeah. right? And there was also a small amount of status. If you know, not anymore so much. But when I was in Wuhan, which you know was the, the you know the the great frontier back then, it was like you know there weren't a lot of foreigners, and so if you could pose with pictures and walk around with and be seen speaking English, you know, in, in, in the, uh, the wet markets or whatever, it was a little bit of a status symbol. So it was always hard to tell, like, like 
Because I don't know if I if I saw somebody that just came in from Japan or Germany or, you know, I don't know that I would just rush to become their friends and take them shopping and and practice my Japanese with them or or whatever. It's just, it was a weird environment. And so I think that some of it could still be transactional, even if there's not money to be made. There could be other, you know, other things gotten from it. Yeah. Which is fine, you know. Jeff, let me edit what I told you earlier. What happened in the Amazon warehouse is they would start getting charged there for their surplus products. And then the students who work for the companies would tell their bosses, hey, I know a guy that lives in America. I'll just send it all to his house so we don't have to pay the surplus. So <laughs> yeah. you're sending them, say, can we just send it, just these 50 smartwatches to your house? You can do whatever you want with them. And I'm like, okay. And so that's how I got all these free trinkets and things from these yeah. Chinese run Amazon stores and then tried to sell them, but did not work because they were kind of crappy. Kind of echoing what you're saying, kind of the, the, even the residue of the Maoist era still being in China in 2017. One of my last nights there, I think I've told you this story. I hung out with one of my friends who I, she was probably like my girlfriend at the time. Um, I thought it was my last night in China. So we you know, hung out and then the next day I had to go to work. Work started at like, I was teaching English, so work started at like two, but I was hungover and I walked, I took my dinner break at like six, 6 p.m., like kind of close to rush hour. And I walked down into one of those subway uh, malls, those underground like- Yeah, yeah, underground malls. Stands. And so I was walking down the stairs, which the subway stairs were a little bit narrower than the stairs in America. I never got used to that when I was there, but I remember feeling a little like, God, I don't really have a- good grip on these stairs as I'm walking down. I fell. One, I twisted my ankle and I fell all the way to the landing between these two flights. And I was laying there like while people were walking back and forth by me. And I'm laying there like, God, my my leg really hurts. My knee really hurts. And then it's like, nobody's stopping. Nobody is asking me if I'm okay because it fucking hurt. And I remember thinking like, okay, this is a very good example of being immersed in a culture. There was that thing they had going on there where if someone, someone could like stage getting hurt in public and then a person comes up and says, Hey, Oh, I'm sorry. Can I help you? Then the person acting like they're hurt could then extort the person who was trying to be a good Samaritan. That legal loophole was closed like within six months after I, that happened. But that's a crazy thing. That was just such a glaring example of the difference in a, in a culture. Oh yeah, it happened to my uh, yeah, it happened to my brother-in-law. It did. Um, he was a truck driver. Yeah, no, totally. He's Chinese, happened. right? He, yeah, he was, he was driving a big truck. Uh, he, uh, you know, this is just one example. This is one example he told us. But this, and there was a lady. It was this old lady walking down the road, and she had fallen. She was on the ground. So he stops his truck, and he gets out of the truck, and he walks over to her. You know, now on the side of the road, he, he touches her like he's going to pick her up. Like, are you okay, old lady? She grabs his hand and says, and says oh, she starts screaming, oh, he hit me. He hit me. And then, you know, of course, now that's the thing about, about China, right? Once something like that's going down, then you get a crowd. Now everybody wants to be around you. Everybody wants to stop. Everybody wants to start looking and checking things out. Um, there was no cell phones. You know, this was like. There's no like cameras on cell phones back then. It was like 18 years ago. So he, anyway, he had to pay her money. The police came, right? And they're like, they're like, we know you didn't, you know, but she's old and she's on the ground. And can you just give her like 300 RMB or 200 RMB or something, whatever it was, you know, 30 bucks. And he was like, no, I didn't do anything. And they're like, yeah, but man, you come on, man. She's going to like <laughs> stay on the ground and she's going to like, and so he did. He did. Well, I've, I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it. There's a lady on a bike on the side of the street. Car pulls up even kind of close and she falls into. I mean, it's like I feel like I was watching soccer, you know, just flops on the ground with no, you know, no reason whatsoever. And then, you know, hits the, the car and then she's laying next to the tire and she won't move, you know, and then she's just cry, crying out and calling out. And, you know, it's like. It, it's just that, uh, that it's crazy. Once, yeah. and, I, and I'd learned that somebody get told me the story, like you got to go on the offensive real fast. So that's what I kind of learned in China. If there's an issue, you got to go on the offensive real fast. Not Don't be backing up. 
Well, I was I was coming out of a McDonald's drive-thru and I had I came out and it was a kind of a weird little exit and and there was like a, a cars parked and then there was like people that would walk and then there was cars parked on the other side of the street and it was it was all blocked so I kind of come out I was, it was really slow I wasn't like didn't run into the guy I'm looking I'm looking and I and I pull forward and this bicycle runs right into my kind of my front left tire not real fast so I get out I stop the car and I get out and I just start berating this guy like like what are you doing riding your bicycle so fast where are you stupid like come on, what did you not look did you not see my car and he's like freaking out. He's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he sees the foreigner and now he's getting all worried. And now, you know, because because if I wouldn't have done, and then he got up and, his, and I looked at my car, like, I, like Man, you did it in my car. I like, you, you did it in my car. Like I, I broke his bicycle. <laughs> but I'm like, you did it in my car. And he's now he's worried that I'm gonna say to him, dude, you gotta like you gotta give me some money for my for my for my car. So I Real said, nice yeah. I said, well, anyway, look, it's all good. Go on. Be careful. I'll fix the car. And he's like, he just ran away. <laughs> if I wouldn't have gone yeah. a little bit on the aggressive, if, if I had been like, oh my gosh, are you okay? I knew it was fine. It, was, it, yeah. it wasn't like, it wasn't like on the highway. It was just literally the guy just ran in my car. But if I wouldn't have been aggressive and if I would have been like, we would be in the, in the West. Like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Is your bicycle okay? Are you okay? You know, you hurt. They, as sad as it is to say, I probably could have been, oh, I'm hurt. Oh, you know, my shoulder hurts. And, and the next thing you know, and this, this happened, you know, David happened to you when you had that car accident, these yeah. people late, I don't want to say it like that. Anyway, what happens is they work. Now they're hurt. Now they go to the doctor. Doctor says, Oh, you need to stay seven days in the hospital. You hurt yourself. You gotta. And so then they're happy. They don't got to go to work seven days in the hospital. Next thing you know, you're paying money because you know, they miss work and, and you got to give them some money. You got to pay the, the doctor's bills. And, and I've been in the hospital when my son broke his arm and we were in overnight and they were having like a party in there. I mean, those guys with like broken arms are drinking beers. They're having a great time. They're like cat calling the nurse. Like this, this is great because, because they don't need to be in the hospital, but Hey, they're there for seven days, 10 days. They're getting paid. They're loving it. They don't go back to work. Vacation. Yeah. So that's, that's the whole culture of that, you know, and yeah, it, it, not everybody does that. So I don't want to, be like that can't general yeah it sounds like we made some generalizations here and we're trying not to it's just based on our experiences 